Hello, I'm Dr. Brian Fraser, and this video I'm going to show how to create a p-thread and pass it in data and return data via pointers. Plus, we're going to run the same thread or the same thread function in multiple separate threads. This is the second video in the sequence on threads. Uh, if you've not yet watched the first video, I do recommend uh, watching it unless you're already fairly familiar with p-threads. So where we stand at the moment is, I've taken the code that we developed in the first thread, I copied it to a new file named sum on many threads, and what we're going to do is we're going to run a thread function similar to this. We're going to edit it a little, but basically what we're doing is we're going to pass in here as an argument a long long, or pointer to a long long, and we're going to sum all values between zero and that number. We're going to then pass the answer back using a different mechanism than before. Before we just used a global variable, now we're going to pass it back um, pa as, a, um, as, some, as a data per thread. The basic thing we want to do is we want to support multiple different threads running at the same time. The only thing I've really done so far is I made a few cosmetic changes to clean up the code, to shorten it down a little, and I changed our help text here. So for the usage, we're going to say, well, you can pr add, put a whole bunch of different arguments on the command line, and we're going to handle them all. So instead, previously, let me make this. So sum on many threads. Previously, we'd make the call, for example, sum on many threads, and we pass just a single argument, we're now going to be able to pass in a whole bunch of different other arguments. In this case, it would sum up on four separate threads. Of course, we're not handling anything beyond the first one yet. So let's figure out what to do here. Well, the first thing we've got is we're only launching a single thread. We have this thread attribute, we create a thread ID, and then we simply um, call pthread create. It only calls one thread. So we want to launch multiple threads. I'm going to appear at the top compute the number of threads that we're going to have. So there's going to be an int, and let's call this one numargs, which is the number, or yeah, number of arguments that were actually passed in that we want. And that's going to be equal to the argc, which is the count of the arguments we get, minus one. Because the first one is for the actual file name. That's the convention coming from the shell. So now I know how many I need, this numargs. Let's go down here and start spawning our processes or threads, pardon me. So for int i equals 0, i less than the num args, i plus plus. Now that's not quite what we want, because this thread ID, we need to have a unique thread ID for each of the threads we spawn. We kind of need it down here, because we want to then call pthread join later on. I certainly don't want to spawn a thread, let it do its work, and then immediately in the same part here loop, join on it, because that'll just wait on it. So for example, if I move this up here, it kind of defeats the purpose, because now I'm going to launch a thread, wait till it's done, launch a new thread, wait till it's done. What I really want to do is launch all my threads, let them run in parallel on all my different CPUs, and then wait for them all at the end. So how am I going to do that? Well, I need to be able to access multiple thread IDs. So let's just call this thread IDs, and I'm going to make it an array. So I can put use num args here. So that'll build me an array of thread IDs. So I don't want to use just the first one here. I'm going to say I want the address of thread IDs sub i. So that's a good start. I can, as it turns out, pass in the same attributes to each of them. I'm using the sort of default set of attributes. So I can initialize them up here and then use them in there. Or if I wanted to, I could move this into my for loop. Maybe that's a bit cleaner, so let's do that. I'm then going to run my sum runner, and at the moment I'm passing in the limit that I computed up here, but let's just test this out. It's not going to maybe be perfect, because down here, well, a couple other things I should do before I test this. I now want to go through this, and instead of waiting on just one thread, I want to wait on all the threads. Let's go up here, and I'm going to go for int i equals 0, i less than num args, i plus plus. And I want to wait on threads sub i. All right, let's see what happens. I'm going to build that. Builds OK. And I want to run some on many threads. Let's just make this simple and let's pass in uh, 2, 3, and 4. So it should run three times. Now what ended up happening is it ran the same thread 
three times, right, in the same computation. I can show that we're actually running three different threads by putting in a much larger number. And up here, uh, it's that first one, actually, it takes the value of, so let's put that a bit larger. We should now see here that three of my threads max out. The last thread is sitting fairly low, but I've got three threads that went up to max. And they're going to run for quite a while until it's finished computing all of the values. So I'll leave that running while we go over here to change things. We're currently not extracting the second through the nth argument value passed in. So let's uh, pull those out in here. So instead of doing it up here, let's move it down into my loop. And inside of my loop, I want to pull out here arg v instead of arg v, I'm going to go sub i plus 1. So that's now going to switch to the new value each time. And so that would then kind of compute the appropriate values. The only issue we've got is that that still only gets one answer. I've got this sum, and we see up here we've got this shared sum value. Now, what's going on in the moment? It did all this computation, but it turns out that's actually not going to be the correct answer to anything. Because I had three separate copies of this one function, all executing at once, all accessing a global variable and adding to it. So this may well be three times the answer I'm hoping for. I, of course, don't really know what this is going to come out to. And in fact, it's not likely going to be even just three times that, because I could have synchronization issues where doing plus equals, maybe it kind of ended up corrupting the data somehow. So thread synchronization is a big topic beyond the scope of this video. So what I really want to do is I don't want to continuously add to the same value here, and I can't just use a single global variable to return the value. I could, of course, allocate an array of global variables and access that, but that gets a little more complicated in one sense, and I really want to get out of using these global variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to somehow be passing back the answer. One thing I could do is I can dynamically allocate some space and then pass a pointer back. I'll show that in the next video on the dynamic allocation. You might be tempted to say, well, why don't I just come in here, allocate it in here, and then return a re pointer, so return its address. This seems like it's a good idea, because now each copy of this is going to have their own stack, and we're going to return a value here. But I never want to return a pointer to a local variable that's on the stack. Why? Well, as soon as I leave this function, all of my local variables, so one, two, three, get popped off the stack, and that memory is now deallocated. It might still be valid by the time my pthread join executes, but there's no guarantee of that. So this is actually a terrible idea to do. So what's left? I can dynamically allocate, I can use a global, or it turns out I can actually pass the value in somehow. At the moment, I'm expecting a long, long to come in, but what if I passed in not only the limit that I'm expecting coming in, but also a piece of memory that I should write the answer into. Now how can I do that? I'm, expect, I'm accepting here only a single pointer. I could accept pointers to arrays, but that's a little bit messy. A better way is to pass in a pointer to a struct. So I'm going to create a struct here, and let's call this one uh, sum arg struct. So it's going to be a structure that holds for summing the arguments up. Actually, let's call this sum runner struct. Sum runner struct. And I'm going to pass in first a long, long, that's a limit, the value that we're climbing up to, and a long, long, that's going to be the answer. So these are the two pieces of information I really want. Now when I get the arg here, this is not going to be a pointer to a long, long. This is going to be a pointer to a struct sum runner struct pointer, and I will update this. Let's rename it. I don't really need to rename it, but I'm going to call this the arg pointer. And I can now, well, I could cast it, 
and sort of copy the values over. But I've already got this pointer. It's going to be fine. Let's just call this one our extract. Put that on two lines so, yeah, so we can see what's going on here. So I'm just typecasting my void star into a pointer to my structure, my sum runner struct. I can now get rid of that. So what this is going to look like is here instead of the limit, I need to get the limit out of the structure I'm being passed in. What I call the struct, well I'm accessing it through the arg struct, and I can use minus greater than, which is the arrow, to access an element in the struct that I'm pointing to. So that's pretty good. The next thing that I want to do, I want to get rid of that comment because it's no longer applying. I don't have this global sum. I've got my answer in sum and I need to move it into the structure that I was passed in. So I can say arg struct points to, well the answer, equals sum. And so now assuming that the caller passes me in the appropriate argument here, I can then begin to access the limit as well as the answer. This is quite a powerful way because I can pass in any data into my struct. I can begin adding extra fields and then I just simply access those fields in here. I'm limited by passing in only a single pointer so the struct is really the way around that. Okay, so down here what needs to change? Well instead of me passing in the limit, which is a long, long, and in fact there's a bit of a bug here but we'll uh, mention that in just a sec. I could try something like, let's create this, change this over to be a uh, struct and my type was a sum runner struct and let's call this one arg. The arguments and I can then say args dot limit equals And in here, I'm going to pass in a reference to my args. So this seems like we might be on the right track. Every time through the loop, I'm going to build a new argument, a new structure, and I'm going to pass in that pointer here. And then down here, I can simply exit as before, except now I want to print out the sum. Well, hmm, how do I get that sum? It was inside of this structure up here, but that's inside of a different for loop. It's gone out of scope. So that's one problem I've got. I've got a more nefarious problem here as well. The issue is, is that this variable is trapped inside of this scope. When we leave it, when we go through what end one pass of my for loop, it comes back, it gets destroyed, and a new one gets created on the stack. It's probably going to be in the identical spot, but it's a new variable. I had passed in a pointer to that location on the stack. So again, we've got this problem with the stack. Anytime you're passing a pointer to the stack, you want to make sure that the variable you pointed to has a lifetime at least as long as required. This one does not. So that's a problem. So I need to get this out of here. At the moment, if I ran this, I'd see that every pass through would clobber the last, and my calls to my um, thread function would have some really weird bugs. So I'm going to move it up here, and instead of not just having one argument here, I'm going to have an array of them. So num args. So build me an array of these argument structures. So now down here, I can say nugar num or sorry args sub i dot limit gets this, and I'm going to pass in a point or the yeah, pointer to args sub i. So this is going to cure all of the problems I had. Down here I'm not looking for sum anymore, I'm looking for args, uh, well args sub i, I'll move it into my for loop because I need that i, args sub i dot and I want the answer. So now we're looking pretty good. Let's try this out. I'm going to build, see what errors we've got. Pull this up, no errors. So let's run this again. I'm going to go back here and I'm just going to test it out with some simple things. Three, four, five, six, and seven. So it creates all four, or probably five processes, or five threads, and then each thread executes. Each thread is passed its own structure of a argument as well as a place to put the return value. 
Now, if I watched the process going on in the background, I didn't really see many, much happening there. I can run this again, and I can pass in bigger numbers. So let's pass in 1 million, and, or 1 million, that's 10 million, 20 million, and 30 million. And we should see, oh, happened very, very quick. Well, let's just make this one real longer. So we can see it takes a bit of time on the CPU, but not a heck of a lot. Now the first two qu finish fairly quickly, but the third one takes a long time because I've got the third one as a very large number, larger than the previous two by a couple orders of magnitude. So it goes through quick, and we see here we're only maxing out one processor. Let me go through here, delete two digits off the end of that, and on my 20 million, let's switch it up to 2 billion. We see that we're doing this in sequence. So we're waiting on thread 1, followed by waiting on thread 2, and then wait thre thread 3. So it takes a much longer to do thread 2 than either the other two, so we can see one complete quickly, and then 2, and then 3. Let me run that again. We can watch the processor here. All three processors will go up for, uh, or pardon me, the first one doesn't go up for very long. The third one, the second one stays high for quite a while. This previous blip was because it, it switched uh, processors uh, mid-execution. So that's good. What have we done? We've seen that we can pass a pointer in. We can execute multiple copies of the same thread function. So here I was executing uh, four or so of them. I can go and add a whole bunch more. And it will now spawn quite a few different threads all of which are doing the same pro uh, work for me. They're just doing it on different data. In this case, it's a fairly poor way of computing the answer, but we can see here I spawned a number of different threads. Down here, we went through and we extracted all of the answers into this array. We wanted an array because we needed it outside of this loop, so I needed the answers down here, so I couldn't simply declare the values inside of the loop that created the process, or the threads. Plus, I wanted to have some memory that outlasted this loop. If it was simply a local variable inside of this loop, we saw that it would uh, basically clobber itself and overwrite the values, which is no good. And in the end, I can then output all the values. So let's add another thing in here. So sum for thread, and we're going to print out the thread ID. And the thread ID is going to be an integer. So it's going to be my TIDS sub i. Let me build that. And it's unhappy y. Uh, oh, D argument type is an int, but P thread type is different. So we can see what we've got inside of this. Is it a pointer? No. I'm not sure actually how to get the thread ID. We'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. Uh, I can put out here for thread D, and we can actually print out the number. So I. I'll run that again, and when it finishes now, it's actually going to tell us which of the threads uh, that was. But they're printed out in order, so that's uh, perhaps the obvious way. Okay, thank you for watching. In the next video, I'll show how to do this with dynamic memory allocation using malloc and free.